we've been looking at some aspects of how we can prepare for the last days as the people of God. You know, we want to be ready. That was one of the, the themes. What's one of the main themes of the New Testament is be ready. Of course, we're talking about the last days, but really, who knows what our last days are when the Lord comes for us, right? Those are, so we want to be ready because he could come at any time for our lives. Um, and so we looked at the importance of uh, being wary of deception. And last week about not being fearful of the events that are going to take place in the last days, but even in our lives of things we go through and such that God's with us. We're not to fear what the world fears, but instead we're to walk in the fear of the Lord and he'll be a sanctuary to us. And looking a little farther in, in Matthew 24, just looking at what Jesus is saying, you know, he talks about persecution and hatred, offense, all of these things we have to be mindful of as believers. You know, as, as Christians, that's something that we can expect to see against us. Right? We, we kind of know that's clear in the scripture of what Jesus warned us about. Um, you know, we can expect to see that against us. But what we want to make sure is that those things don't rise up in us. It's one thing for them to be in the world, and we shouldn't be surprised when that comes against us as believers. But we sure want to make sure. Want to make sure right? We want to make certain that that does not rise up in us. Um you know, in this world, you can have two sides of everything and those two sides go at it and fight. And we've seen that in our nation in various ways, um, but it can be in politics or religion or sports or whatever. And both sides think they're right. right? They both think that um, sometimes they even think they're the righteous ones, um, both of them at the same time. Right. And of course, that means if you're the righteous, then your, your opponent kind of is automatically not righteous or wicked, evil, that kind of connotation. But when you look at the words and the actions of those who think they're righteous, but they're, but in fact, they're both the same. If they're full of anger, hatred, offense, which all of that eventually leads to persecution and violence. Jesus told us to watch out for those things. We can see it and expect to see it in the earth. But what we have to make sure is it's not found in us. Because those things in the world, they, they will have an effect on us. And that's what we want to be so careful of. And I want to, to focus on these verses here, Matthew uh, 24, verse 12. I'm going to start off in the good old King James. I, I kind of like this, how it says, it says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That's very poetic, Shakespearean. All right. it, it says a lot in a few words. The love of many will wax cold. You know, when our love for Jesus starts to cool, kind of like wax, when wax is cools, it becomes hard. All right. Someone threw a wax candle, that would hurt if it hit you. But if it's warm and it's soft, right, it's that, that's a different characteristic. It's soft because of the warmth. And, you know, we want to be careful of the coolness because that leads to hardness. And I want to read it from another translation. This is the ESV. So Matthew 24, 12, it says, And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Verse 13, But the one who endures to the end shall be saved. And so the, con the connotation there is the one who endures to the end, avoiding the influence of lawlessness. They're the ones that are going to be protected, kept. So there's, a, there's some interesting things we can learn from this, these verses, especially kind of looking at some of the Greek words. And I want to just consider some of them. The first one is love. The word used here is agape. And so the, the thought here is, div, is divine love, the divine love, the divine love of many will grow cold. And that's a scary thing because that's the divine love of Christ that he puts within us. 
So in the last days, there's going to be a big group of people who have the divine love of Christ and it grows cold. Maybe for, for some of them, it even dies because of lawlessness. When they stand before the Lord, there won't be anything that he will recognize in them. They won't have love. They won't have fruit. It was destroyed because of iniquity or lawlessness. Now, the Greek word for iniquity or lawlessness is anomia, which means without law, not being submitted to the law. Uh, and basically, it, it means not wanting to submit to God's law or come under the law of God, which means his, his control, his direction, his word, the leading of his spirit. You know, this concept of lawlessness has, we've kind of seen some stark examples of that this past year, especially in our nation. Very sad examples in our society. Although, you know, that can be the ultimate result. I don't, I don't think this is necessarily what Jesus is getting at. He's, I don't think he's trying to keep us from having lawlessness in our country. I think it's more he's concerned about the effect of it in our hearts in the hearts of his people, because we're looking at the Greek words here, this, you know, and we looked at the phrase to grow or wax cold. I'm going to butcher this Greek word. It's psucho. I think that's it. Maybe if not be gentle. All right. And this word means to breathe or to cool down by blowing. And that's a concept we can understand. All of us have had a cup of coffee and it came straight out right off the burner and we, t we take a sip and woo, that's hot. So we blow on it until it's drinkable. But that's the concept of, of a chilling wind blowing upon our love for the Lord so it starts to cool down. Of course, it blows long enough, right? It'll be a cold drink or lukewarm, which God says he spits out. And so what Jesus is describing is a chilling wind cooling their agape love for him. And how does that happen? Through iniquity or lawlessness. It's where someone no longer accepts the ways of God, his conditions, his commandments, his sometimes his confinements. Right? I, I've got a new picture of that with we're studying I'm going to bring up Pilgrim's Progress a lot because that's kind of on my mind in our Bible study. You know, I just have that picture of Christian walking down the, the straight way, the King's Highway, and there's a wall on either side and it's kind of, it's walled in. It's straight and it's confining. He, you know, if even if he wanted to, he can't go to the right or left. He'd have to climb over the wall, which he does to his detriment. It's the straight way. If we submit to that, we're in his safety, in his hand, in his protection. But when we get out of that, we become lawless in that sense. And so Jesus says there's a cool wind blowing in the last days. It's a wind that destroys our love for the Lord because it causes it to grow cold. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a mystery when you think about it because it's like, well, how do you define it? How does it take place? What, what can we look for? Well, there's lots of examples you can give, but it's really hard to define. It's kind of a mystery. We don't see it happening. We just feel the results of it, right? We just feel, oh man, my love. Has something been blowing on it lately? Because I, I need to be revived. Maybe we just feel the warning of the spirit to avoid something. And that's the only indication we have. And in 2 Timothy, or Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7, it says, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, right? It's a mystery, but it is already at work. It, it was working 2000 years ago when Paul wrote this and it's working now. Only, it goes on, only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. Now this is officially talking about the Antichrist, but you can talk about the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of lawlessness is working in the earth right now. And God is saying, he's restraining it until the perfect time and then the fullness will come and then he removes it when he brings victory. 
the ultimate spirit of lawlessness will be the Antichrist, but God's in control of that. But we have to be careful of this mysterious force. You know, Jesus compares the Holy Spirit to a wind, doesn't he? And he said, we don't know where the wind comes from or goes. So is the working of the Holy Spirit. We can't see him. We kind of sense his moving. We don't know where he goes after that. It's just developing a sensitivity to the moving of the Spirit. But in the same way, we have to develop a sensitivity to lawlessness, to that Spirit working in our age and trying to affect our hearts. We have to be on guard for it. In fact, Jesus says exactly that. You know, we've been looking at Matthew 24, but there's actually uh, a corresponding um, discourse, you could say, in the other Gospels in Luke and a bit in Mark. Um, but it, I wanted to look at what Jesus says, and these words are a little different. He, he includes some different concepts in Luke 21. And he says this, I'm reading from the ISV. I'm switching translations all over the place here. But Jesus says this to his disciples, talking, and he's talking about the last days. He says, constantly be on your guard so that your hearts will not be loaded down with self-indulgence, drunkenness, and the, the worries of this life, or, the, or that the day or that day will take you by surprise. We can have an awareness of what's going to happen if we're focused on God, but if we allow other things to go in and make us dull, make us cool, then it'll take us by surprise. Verse 35, like a trap, because it will come upon everyone who lives on the face of the earth. So be alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all the things that are going to take place. That's a quite a thought. Lord, give me strength for the last days. Give me strength to face what we're going to face and to take your stand in the presence of the son of man. I like that last phrase. We're called to take our stand in the presence of the son of man. We have a place to stand before the king that he's calling us to stand in, but we have to be on guard for this cool wind that's blowing. It's blowing upon us coming from the spirit of this age, the spirit of this world and it's looking to destroy our love relationship with the Lord, or at least affect it, cool it. If he can just bring down the level of our fire, and the more he gets it down, the easier it is, because we're just not aware before we know it. Hopefully we won't be like Laodicea, which the Lord says, you're lukewarm. I wish you were either warm or cold, but because you're lukewarm, we know the result. No, another church was in a, a pretty terrible situation, or at least when you see the letter that was being written to them. You know, the Lord was writing to one of the churches in Asia uh, during the Apostle John's day. You remember what he said to Ephesus? He commended them, first off, for their good works. He said they had labored for him. They had worked hard. They had been faithful. They had stood even against certain evils of the day and in their society for enduring. But there was one problem. Revelation 2 and verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because you have left your first love. You see, that's everything. Doesn't matter what precedes it. If we leave our first love, if our love grows cold, then it's all for nothing. So even though they were doing good things for the Lord, they had allowed that cool wind to blow and it had caused their love relationship with the Lord to wax cold. And this is really one of the great warnings of the last day. And we're facing this spirit of lawlessness that would seek to replace our love for the Lord with other things. And in fact, even good things. The church and the, the saints at Ephesus thought, hey, we're doing a good work here. We're doing all sorts of good stuff and good programs and all sorts of activity. But in the midst of that, they didn't realize their, their love and their zeal and their fire for the Lord had grown, grown dim. 
That's why this subject's kind of scary when you think about it. How could a church full of good, people doing good things for God cease to love the Lord? And that's part of the mystery. That's why we have to be, as Jesus said, be constantly on guard, be constantly examining, keeping the temperature of, of our hearts and our fire to make sure that it's, it's warm. You know, that being careful of allowing our love to be replaced by other things, even if they're seemingly good or just. You know, even in our day, when you we're seeing injustice, I mean, I don't think anyone can question that. There's some injustice going on in the world and, and things happening. And, you know, when you see injustice, some have made a point of making a stand for injustice and, and so forth, or for the principle of freedom and free speech. And, and they've made that their focus. And it's not necessarily a bad thing that we have free speech because that's a protection for us as Christians. But we have to be so careful, especially as believers, that we don't make our focus to be something that God is not in or that becomes a replacement of our love for God and doing his will or doing just even doing something he's not directing us to be in, that he's not telling us to be here, to be in that. Because when we step outside of our boundaries, that's when we face the cool wind. We don't no notice it at first. It's just a little cool wind. And sometimes we're even like, you're outside of the, if you ever been kind of confined in kind of a strict time and you get out of that strict time and it's like, woo, man, I have freedom. And even a cool wind, you, you like it for a time. It's like, ah, oh, cool breeze. But after a time, it gets, you know, it's a little chilly. It starts to affect your temperature. And so we, we have to be careful of that because we're talking about our spirit and our heart and our love for God. You see, when our love starts to grow cold, that's when Satan can get a hold of us and start to have power. I told you I was going to get back to Pilgrim's Progress. But, you know, as we've been studying that, there's a, there's a part in the story we haven't come to yet in our Bible study, but we'll, we'll have a preview. And it's where Christian comes to a place called Bypath Meadow. And the problem Christian's facing is that the king's highway that he's on it's been a straight kind of road, but then it comes to a place where it's rocky and, and it's really difficult to walk on and it's not pleasant. And he, they're going for a time as is Christian and hopeful here. And they're just walking on this pathway and it's like, man, this is hard. And they look to their, I think it was their left and they saw this meadow that was going parallel and the meadow was this nice soft grass. And they thought, what are we doing on this hard, rocky ground? Let's walk on the nice, soft grass in the meadow. So they thought about it for a little bit. Hopeful was a little, are you sure we want to do this? And Christian said, oh, I think it's fine. Well, little did they know because they got out and into the meadow and it was a nice way to go. But little did they know that they had stepped in the, to the domain, the realm of the giant despair and his home, Doubting Castle. And as soon as they stepped out of the way, they were in his territory on his radar and he captured them and he locked them up in their, in his dungeon. And so, you know, we're asking ourselves, how can a church like Ephesus full of good works cease to, to love the Lord? It's a mystery, but you know, stepping out of the way, even just a little bit, even if you can see the pathway, that's what I've always done right here. I'm just right here. You see, we're no longer in the, on the king's highway, but we're in the domain of someone else and it opens the door by focusing on other things. It, you know, it allowed Christian and hopeful to be captured. And you could say that for the Ephesian church as well. Thankfully, Christian, he remembered around his neck, he had a key called the key of promise and he was able to open the dungeon door and sneak out and they got free. But how much better if they had recognized the danger, they did afterwards for sure. 
they, if they don't, only could have recognized the danger of stepping out of the king's highway, of his straight path, of his commandments. And I think what Jesus is telling us here is that in these last days, which is really our day, it doesn't really matter or not whether we see the Antichrist you know, out in the open or if he's not appearing yet, but we're facing this spirit of lawlessness in our day. And it's only going to get stronger. It's only going to get more powerful. The temptation, this drawing for God's people is to step out from under his way, his wisdom, his direction, because of something we think is good or something we like or something that's appealing to us to step out from under God like Ephesus. Little did they know the devastating effect it would have when they stepped out from under what God was saying. And, you know, it doesn't even specify what exactly they did. They just let the love be replaced with something else. You know, we're kind of taken back to Jesus' first warning about do not be deceived. Do not, do not let our hearts be deceived to look to anything else but what he is speaking to us and to the direct thing he's leading us in. And as it says in Psalm 95 and verse 7, it says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Yet yeah, the implication is, is if we will stick closely to his voice, then we'll, keep, we'll be like that soft wax, pliable, being able to be used by him, led by him, shaped by him. But when we cease hearing his voice today, that's when our hearts get hard. When we step out of the pathway, that's when the cool wind starts to blow. And I was thinking of King David. He is known as a man after God's own heart. And he literally lived in the presence of the Lord. Wouldn't that be something? I mean, he literally lived in the presence of God. He went and sat before the ark. You know, he, he had the divine counsel and direction, and he lived in God's presence. Yet in that, something arose in his heart that he didn't anticipate, and it led him into sin, deep sin, right? Adultery and murder. Looking back, you can, you can kind of imagine him after the fact saying, I wish I had seen that. I wish I had known that that was in my heart and had done something about it, avoided stepping out from under the protection of God in that situation. Well, there's a psalm uh, that's in, that was written by David. At least it's entitled the Psalm of David. It's Psalm 139. Some commentators think that David wrote this later in life. I mean, we're not exactly sure, but this, this is um, what some have said. Perhaps when he was looking back, having a, a perspective of his life and some of the things he'd gone through. And, and he says this in verse 23. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now, Lord, search me. I don't, I don't know what's in me and what I'm capable of. And, you know, really, we are all capable of sinful things because we are sinful creatures. And the thought that we inherited a nature of sin, it always bugs me when I see things in the world and, you know, especially with young people and they're saying, don't you trust me? No, I don't trust anyone. We're all sinners. I don't trust any. <laughs> Anyone, unless I see Christ in them, and it's, I trust Christ in people. But if Christ isn't there, I'm not a very trusting person. I don't even trust myself. And so, you know, we can go along with David here. Lord, search me. There's things in me that I know aren't good. Inclinations. Things that will lead me in a wicked way. And David cried out, Lord... I don't know if this happened, you know, I, I'm assuming he wrote this afterwards and he's saying, Lord, I don't trust myself. I don't trust the way that I, I think I should go. And that, that's, of course, that's what it says in Proverbs, what he taught Solomon. Man thinks he knows the way to go. 
until he tries to walk in it. And then we realize, I don't know. Lord, search me, remove those things and lead me in the way everlasting. That's a good prayer to pray so that God would reveal anything in us that would draw us off the path. Just a couple more thoughts. You know, I was remembering a story that Pastor Bailey, um, actually, the Lord gave this to Pastor Bailey's wife. Um, his wife once had a vision of a conveyor belt, and he put this in one of his books, and it says he saw a con- she saw a conveyor belt with magnets placed above it, and he said that as the, as the materials passed along the conveyor belt, magnets removed the flaws from the objects passing below them. Uh, and all the magnets were adjusted differently to attract different metals. And God spoke to his wife and said, in life there are magnets, and those magnets will draw a heart away from the pathway of God if there is something in the heart that responds to that magnet. And there are many different magnets. There's magnets of idolatry. There's magnets of media. There's magnets of immorality, worldly pleasures, many other things. And the Lord was speaking to Sister Bailey that, that God put those things to draw hearts away that did not become cleansed, that did not allow him to come and remove those things. And really, that is what Jesus is warning us about in the last days. Basically, he's saying in the last days, there's going to be many, many magnets trying to draw our heart this way and that way. And the only way we can stay in his pathway is if we meet God and he removes those things and cleanses us and keeps us so closely focused upon him because the hearts of many are going to be drawn away and that cool wind will make them cold. It's kind of a somber thought, but it's in scripture, so we have to consider it. All right, you ready for the scariest verse in scripture? Why not? <laughs> We're already there, so let's read it. Matthew seven twenty two. At least I think it's one of the scariest. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out devils? Didn't we do many wonderful works? Didn't we do many good things? I think that's probably where some people in the Ephesian church would be. Lord, aren't we laboring night and day doing good things for you? But verse 23, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. There's many magnets that are going to draw people out of the, the pathway of righteousness who previously did good things. But when they come to the end of their lives, God won't know them because they didn't stay in his pathway. They stepped out. So what are we to do? One last thought, just in closing. And it's another Pilgrim's Progress. And I just wanted to close with that illustration of Pilgrim's Progress that it was so present to us. We looked at it in our last Bible study, um, but it's where Christian is taken to the house of the interpreter and he sees a beautiful palace. And there's a crowd of pilgrims kind of at the door ready to go into the palace, but there's a problem. And the problem is, is that there's also another crowd and it's a crowd of villains and they're blocking the door and they're looking to do mischief, as it says uh, in the book. They're looking to do harm to those who are trying to get through into the door. And so they're just standing there kind of, what do we do? They're blocking us. And there's a a man at a table with a a book and a pen and he's there to record anyone who tries to get through. And, And Christian sees someone in the crowd and he goes to the table and he says, Sir, put my name down. I'm going to go in. And he pulls his sword and he just runs at them and starts whacking them and hacking them and fighting his way through. And in the book, it says he made it through, but not without some wounds. But yet he made it to the other side. And they rejoiced that he was able to make it through that fight into the beautiful city, the beautiful palace. You know, that kind of represents one of the mindsets we have to have. Not, it's not the only mindset, thankfully. 
we're not just called to out, go out whacking with the sword, but there's times that we have to be violent, as it talks about in Matthew 11, as good soldiers of Jesus Christ to fight our spiritual battles. Of course, we fight not against flesh and blood, so don't, don't go out there with a real one, real sword. But we're, we're to fight against anything that would prevent us from following Christ, whether external, whether it's Satan, and he's out there as a roaring lion seeking to trap us, devour us, prevent us from following Jesus, or whether it's within, something within us, in our hearts. Sometimes I think that's the harder thing to deal with. Satan's out there, but what do you do with something in here? Sometimes we'll feel that pull, the magnet drawing us in a certain direction. Or maybe we don't feel it. We're just like Christian. All of a sudden we're out there and we see the giant despair coming for us. What do we do? Jesus said this, one last verse, Matthew 5 and verse 30. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast in hell. You know, when we're facing, of course, he's not talking about literal, the literal concept there. But when we're facing something in the spirit that opposes us, whether it's the enemy or if it's just something in our life, there's really only one recourse. We remove it. We pick up the sword of the spirit and we fight Sometimes it can be painful, especially if it's something in our life, especially if it's something we, we want or we think we want. And it can be painful. Sometimes it involves dealing with things, maybe asking forgiveness because of something we've, we've done or acknowledging that we were wrong. Of course, we all like to appear as perfect Christians and don't want anyone to think that we, we do wrong. But, but, you know, if we allow these things to remain, we're opening our heart to the cool wind blowing and cooling down our love relationship with the Lord. And so the Lord is warning us as believers in the last days to be watchful, to be mindful, to be on constant guard, as it says in Luke in that translation, because the mystery of lawlessness is at work. There's a lot of magnets out there seeking to draw us off of his pathway but we can pray like David. Lord, search me. Lord, try me. Lord, reveal anything in me. Maybe we already know it. And then, we, then we're at that point of decision. What do I do about it? We just say, Lord, this is not worth keeping if it's going to pre prevent me from following you, prevent me from walking on your pathway. We'd, it's better to go into eternity lacking that thing, which in reality, when we get to eternity, we'll realize that thing was terrible to keep because it was, we're not losing anything. We're gaining everything. But Lord, lead me in the way everlasting. We might have wounds from it, but it will allow us entrance into that glorious city where we'll hear that wonderful phrase, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord.